Welcome to this edition of In Focus, where we get to take a deep dive into something that's on your mind and something that affects our lives. I've been traveling. I was at a conference recently, and as we often do at the end of the conference, there was a, a panel discussion with questions and answers. One of the questions that came up from our audience was my opinion uh, as to whether or not I felt like we would have a cyber attack sometime in the near future, what that cyber attack would mean to our world, what it would mean to our lives. And the, the question itself opened up a, a deeper conversation. Two things came from that conversation that are prompting me to, to make this recording for you today. Number one, there were a lot of people in the audience who are unfamiliar with the technology and with the terminology really didn't even understand what a, a cyber attack meant other than maybe having an impact on their home computer or on their, their cell phone. And number two, uh, it was apparent very quickly that most of the people in our audience and the people that they knew and their friends and their families and in subsequent conversations, what I'm finding, it, finding out is that a, a large portion of our community uh, are very unprepared for the event of, of a cyber attack and the implications it would have in our society. You know, we're living in a time of extremes. That's no surprise to you. And you've heard me say this many times in the past. It doesn't mean only bad things happen, but it means big things happen. It means we're living a time of volatility. And I think you certainly feel that in a, a lot of different areas in your life, whether it's in our society or politics or government or national security or food security or water security or climate, uh, whatever it is, it's not business as usual. And I wanna be really clear. I, I don't think we are going to go through this period of volatility forever. We're living a little window of time where we owe it to ourselves. It's a responsible thing to do, to think a little bit differently, to accommodate that volatility. It's only a problem if we discount it. It's only a problem if we ignore it. It's only a problem if we turn away, put our heads in the sand and play like nothing is happening. And if there is something happening, it's not going to affect us because that's when we get caught off guard. That's when it becomes a problem. So I wanna do a couple of things today. First, I wanna to talk to you about uh, cyber security and cyber attacks to begin with and what it is that you can do for yourself, if you live alone, or if you've got a roommate, or uh, you know, a family, or a community, what you can do—a few simple things that you can do—just to to take the edge off of some of the impact that could be looming in our uh, near future. So I'll begin with the way I answered the question: Do I think we will have a cyber attack? The answer is yes. Uh, I don't think it's a question of if it's going to happen. Uh, I believe that it is a question of when, and my sense is it's probably going to happen sooner than later. I'll give you some information to help you understand why, why I feel that way. One of the things uh, that, that came out quickly is, is people felt like, okay, big deal. You know, so we have a cyber attack. We're used to hearing of computer viruses, certainly, malware on our, uh, you know, in our social media uh, ransomware, where people will hijack our, our information and our data, and they won't give it back until we, we make some kind of a payment. We've all heard of those things in the news. What a lot of people don't realize is that our entire society, our entire infrastructure now is based upon digital applications run by AI and computers. Everything in your life, unless you are really blessed and really fortunate Maybe you live in a self-sufficient, uh, independent, isolated community where you have your own infrastructure and you are unplugged from the world at large. My experience is very few people have the, the luxury of, of living that way. And if they do, you're probably not seeing this because you don't have a computer and you're not plugged into what we're talking about. So uh, one of the, the controversies that came up during the conference was that to even have this conversation was fear-mongering, okay? That's an old mindset. It's an old idea. And I think it comes from fear itself because it's a lot easier just to discount the potentials of, uh, of the things that we're going to talk about. It's a lot easier just to say, oh man, you're just trying to scare people. 
Uh, you've gone to the dark side. It's never going to happen. Why waste our time? It's a lot easier to do that and go about your daily life. And I agree, it is easier until it's not, until the day happens that something unfolds and you're not prepared for, and then you have to depend on someone else. You're looking for friends that have had the courage to think differently. Uh, if you are depending upon political institutions, if you're depending upon your government, uh, local government, or your federal government to take care of you, they are probably less prepared to do so right now than they have been for a very long time. It's a different conversation. It's a separate conversation. Uh, but there is a, a shift that is happening across the board, federal and state levels. And I'm, I'm speaking to my brothers and sisters here in the United States. But a lot of what I'm saying is true in other countries as well. I've just been back and forth across the Atlantic uh, six times in the last uh, few months. Uh, with our European audiences. And what they're saying is, Greg, you know, you're right on. We're seeing exactly what, what you're talking about here. So we might be separated by distance, but the same principles are, are playing out. When we talk about a, a cyber attack, first of all, we're talking about an intentional act of malice. And there are a number of reasons why I think uh, we can probably expect that to happen. Uh, at some point in the near future, I'm going to show you some slides in a few minutes, and then I'll talk about why that is. But the impact would be across the board. If we had what is called a deep cyber attack, it would do more than just influence your laptop or your cell phone or your ability to get on you know, YouTube or Facebook or, or whatever it is. I've got a list here, uh, just a, uh, a handwritten list I put together as I was preparing uh, to have this conversation with you. One of the greatest concerns, one of our greatest vulnerabilities here in the United States is our electrical power grid. We, uh, we do not have what is called a hardened power grid. A hardened power grid would eliminate some of the vulnerability from all kinds of things. And, and not just cyber attacks. I'm talking about you know bad weather, weather extremes, climate extremes, uh, terrestrial weather, space weather. We're talking about magnetic storms. Uh, solar flares, all kinds of things. Our electrical power grid is really vulnerable right now. I'm going to show you some slides in a few minutes uh, that will help to understand why that is. But that would be one of the first places that we would feel the effects of uh, a deep cyber attack. And once the power goes down, it affects everything. Unless you're living a life of about 1868 or 1880, right around in there. Uh, before electricity really became popular in, in, in the early uh, part of the late part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, it would impact every every aspect of your life. Supply chains obviously would break down uh, within hours and days. And when we talk about these cyber attacks, we're talking about the kind of an attack that uh, it's not a transitory attack. It's going to last a few minutes and everything just comes back up and you just wait it out. But we're talking about the ability to uh, the, the potential, the possibility of our power grid going down for periods, extended periods of time, uh, days, weeks, possibly longer, but definitely for weeks. Uh, so supply chains, water delivery. If you live in a in a city, in an urban area, your water comes to you unless you're living on. Um, in a rural area where you have your own wells, you're vulnerable to the lack of water coming from the city because the power that requires that water to get to you. And it's not just about pumping it through the pipes. It's about acquiring the water, maintaining the water supply, purifying the water supply and getting it to you uh, using smart grids. The smart grids determine where the water is needed and when and how much to pump where. That ability would, would be lost. Uh, medical services would be lost. The ability to communicate medical records, uh, to transport uh, medical samples, blood work, when it, you get it taken at one place and has to go out you know, for, for somewhere else. Communications certainly would be vulnerable. Cell towers would be one of the first things that would go. And that causes a lot of panic in people. If they can't pick up that phone and talk to their family or their friends on demand, uh, we haven't seen that in our world in a very, very long time. We haven't seen it in this generation, in this cell phone generation. 
on a mass scale. We've seen it locally, certainly when disasters happen. You know, Hurricane Katrina, for example, comes to mind, knocked out all the power in the grids, but that was localized. We're talking about national or perhaps international uh, effects. And I'm going to tell you why uh, I'm, I'm saying this to you, but I just want you to know we're talking about more than a bad day on, on the computer. Food storage, the ability to refrigerate food and to store food and to transport food and to get it to your local grocers, your ability to go in and get that food, anything that depends upon a computer would be impacted uh, in a what is called a deep cyber attack. Now, why am I why am I focusing on the cyber attack? Well, one is because it was the question that was asked in, in the conference. Why were the people in the conference asking about the cyber attack? The reason is it's in it's in the air. Everybody is talking about it. Uh, we've got movies that are being made about it. We have government officials telling us to prepare for it. And this is all part of something that uh, I haven't talked about a lot with you in, in these conversations called predictive programming. Some of you are very familiar with that. Some have never heard of it before. Predictive programming is a, a really bizarre phenomenon where we are essentially warned through a number of different sources about an event before that event happens. Sometimes the warnings are done consciously by those that want us to, to know what's happening. Sometimes it's unconsciously. It's consciousness senses that something is up and will begin developing entertainment and movies portraying different scenarios about an event before that event uh, ever happens. Um, we have seen this, we certainly saw this with the pandemic. There were all kinds of movies that were coming out about uh, uncontrolled viruses, viral epidemics, um, you know, strange virus that shows up and a couple of people get it. Uh, it's mysterious. Nobody knows what it is. And pretty soon it spreads. And, you know, some of them were blockbuster movies and some were really crummy movies. But the idea, the, the point is that we, in our consciousness, were conditioned we have other kinds of predictive programming. I think many of you have probably at least heard about the film that came out. It was released, I think, late. I think it was released in the, in the spring of this year, spring of 2024, Leave the World Behind. It's not the best uh, film in the world in terms of, uh, of, of acting or production values, but the idea of the film, uh, and it was uh, Julia Roberts was featured in the film. Kevin Bacon was in the film. I think Ethan Hawke was in the film, I believe. Could be wrong on that. Uh, I, I, I'm doing this off the top of my head. I believe it's Ethan Hawke. And it was focused on a, a family uh, at a family getaway that suddenly realizes they're out of touch from the rest of the world because nothing is working. Everything has gone down. There has been a global cyber attack. And what did that mean to them? So the, this was an example, and it really started people thinking about this. And, and this is an example of predictive programming. Of course, there have been other uh, apocalyptic films uh, that we've all seen. So we call them sci-fi films, uh, horror films in the past, where something happens and, uh, and all the power goes out. So in those films, sometimes they're natural disasters or natural events. You know, an asteroid hits the Earth or volcanoes or... You know, something like that. What we're talking about right now is a an intentional uh, cyber attack. So what I, I want to do, I, I just want to really drive home the point. This is more than just something that happens on your laptop or your iPad. If we have uh, a cyber attack, it will influence and impact every facet of your life and of my life. And it will do it in ways that we probably haven't experienced in our lifetimes. That can sound frightening if you are reasonably prepared. I'm not talking about, you know, going to extremes, although some people are. But if you've taken reasonable precautions, you can minimize the impact. And not only for yourself, but if you've taken care of yourself, it helps you to be available to take care of others. And I don't know about you, but for me, that is really important to me. I I like to think that I'm an asset in the lives of my friends and my families and my neighbors. And as I have the, the ability to look at the world around me and prepare for eventualities to, to some degree, 
uh, because I know a lot of my friends and families and neighbors do not. They don't have the time. They don't have the interest. They're not plugged in to world events. Uh, they're not plugged into local events. They're busy trying to put food on the table for their families, trying to take care of their kids. Many of them have uh, my rural community here in northern New Mexico. Many of them work two or three jobs in, in, in the family. Who's got time, you know, to think about this stuff? So I like to think that I can be available and uh, have the ability not only to to help myself to be here for you, but to help my friends, family, and, and neighbors as well. And I want to talk to you about some really easy ways to do that. And again, it's not from a place of fear. I'm not afraid of what's going to happen. I'm recognizing we're living a very, very, man, you're feeling it. It's just a, a very strange time. It's a weird time in history. And I've talked to you about this in other videos, the reasons. We are living a convergence of natural rhythm and cycles. That would be weird unto itself. Piggybacked on top of those, we're living a convergence of a lot of greed uh, and war cycles that are happening, uh, where humans are making the natural cycles, they're capitalizing on uh, upon them, uh, making the the things even worse than than they would be normally. We're living that time. It's not going to last forever. It's a little window of time where we owe it to ourselves just to think a little bit differently, not out of fear, but from love. And I want to make this point. It's, it's very important. Do we make the choices that we make in our lives? Do we make them from the fear of what happens if we don't or from our love for ourselves, our families and our communities and the possibilities of what we know is available to us if we make these choices? Maybe the outcome's the same, but what, what happens to you, what it does to you, what it does to your heart, what it does to your mind, what it does to your soul, very, very different. So I'm inviting you from your love of this world and yourself and your friends and your family to recognize you're here on this planet. You wouldn't be here if you were not here to help navigate this transition that we all know that we're going through. A new human is emerging, a new world is emerging, and we're in that in-between time. So it's from our love of being able to, to lubricate some of the rough edges and to navigate in a kind and in a wise way through this uh, this little window in time that I'm inviting you to, to check out what I'm saying to you right now. And I'm going to jump into a, a few slides because people were in the conference and since the conference, others have asked for specifics. They say, okay, Greg, you know, we get it. We don't know what to do. We don't even know where to begin. Where do we even start to look, you know, for all this stuff? Because they're not plugged into it. They don't think about those things. So I want to give you some suggestions. Uh, and I'll be very clear what I'm going to share with you. I'm going to share some slides of, uh, of alternative food sources, energy sources, water sources, things like that. I have no financial interest in any of those. I don't get any kind of royalty or a fee or a kickback or anything. These are things that I have found useful in my life for myself, my friends, my family. That's just a place to begin. Maybe you won't like what I'm showing you, but you say, ah, I don't like that, but I do like something else. And, and it will bring something else just to get you thinking in this way and just to give you some specifics. If you want to act now, uh, these are places where you can go and you can act right now. Now, I don't want you to panic about this, but I also want you to say there are a lot of people in the world that are having this conversation. And because of that, supplies are moving quickly from the warehouses. Some of the things I'm gonna share with you, it may take longer to get, they may be back ordered because a lot of people recognize what I'm saying to you right now. And they're saying, we, we need to be ready for whatever that is. So, um, so with that in mind, let me jump in. Let me just share with you some slides. I did a presentation in uh, mid-year 2023. I know you all get busy put it to the back of your mind. I'm going to share some of those slides again in case you've forgotten. If you weren't with me then, they're going to be here for you now. And um, if you don't want to see those, you can jump off, off the program right now. I don't want to be redundant. don't want to waste your time. But I want you to know that there, there are inexpensive ways, relatively inexpensive ways, to mitigate the impact of, uh, of what a cyber attack on our nation or in the world the Western world 
uh, what a cyber attack would mean in your life. So with that, let me jump right into these slides for you. So when we talk about electricity in the United States of America and, and North America, in, including Canada, but specifically in, uh, in the, the continental U.S., what we're talking about is a, a series of power grids, surprisingly, a series of uh, very few power grids. There's only three, three main power grids that power uh, our entire nation, over 300 million people. So what you're seeing on the screen is the, the color coded indications of where, where that grid is. The eastern interconnection is everything east of the Rockies is all considered one grid. Uh, the western interconnection, obviously, is west of the Rockies. And interestingly, Texas has its own grid. It's, it is so massive and such a well-developed infrastructure that it is called the Texas Interconnected System. So we run our entire nation on the, the, the strength and the interconnection of these three power grids that we're looking at now. Now, within those power grids, there are subgrids, and this is what you're seeing here. These are subgrids uh, that where the power is being generated and where it's being transmitted and controlled, but all of these are all interconnected and they're all linked to those three grids. And this is what I'm showing you here. This is uh, the, the power transmission grid in the US and you can see it's very dense in the uh, in the upper Midwest. And as you get out into the Western part of the United States, you can see those transmission lines are fewer and much further between. This is partly where our vulnerability comes from. So a cyber attack, the, the intent of a cyber attack would be to weaken and confuse uh, and disable our ability to, to respond to any other kind of attack. It would be to confuse uh, and frighten the public. And you can see how vulnerable we are to that when you see how few, these are the major transmission lines that we're seeing. You get, uh, you know, into Nebraska, Kansas, uh, and from there west, it's pretty dense or, or pretty sparse until you get into Arizona and, and California. So this is what our, our power grids look like by sub-region. Now, there are a lot of threats to the power grid in addition to a cyber attack. I think a cyber attack is the one that we're talking about now uh, and probably the one that is most likely in the near term uh, that has the most certainty of occurring in the near term. And it's not the only thing that could impact our power grid. So even if you're not on board with the, the idea of a cyber attack, I want you to know there are other things. Severe weather obviously can impact our, our power grids. Uh, regional, global, and space-based war. I think you all know, I'm, I'm doing a whole video on this, there's a big push for war in our world right now. In my opinion, it's unnecessary. Uh, it's irresponsible. It's horrible. It's frightening. And we are marching toward some kind of a showdown, uh, whether it happens in Eastern Europe and Ukraine uh, or later this spring, or whether it's going to be in the Middle East or it's a combination of both. I think you all know, and we feel it. And we're watching our Congress vote uh, funds to support those wars. It's our tax dollars. You and I didn't get much to say about that. Congress voted uh, billions and billions and billions have just been authorized to support uh, the, the two major fronts that are happening right now that we're not uh, technically part of, but we are supporting those that are. This is the, the war in Israel and, uh, and the war in, in Ukraine. So there are events that can happen from that war, retaliatory events. So we have been warned that if we continue uh, our support in those wars that we will not be immune, that we will uh, we will feel the effects rather than a kinetic war with troops landing on our soil. I think it's more likely, and this is what the warning is, is that 
uh, our satellites and our infrastructure and our power grid is very vulnerable. And that is where we could expect to see some kind of retaliation. So even if you're not into the, the cyber attack, you know, directly, I think uh, this is something that is certainly a very real possibility in our, our world right now. Space weather, I mentioned earlier, uh, magnetic storms, solar storms from the sun, solar flares, uh, cosmic radiation volleys I talk about in other videos, all kinds of things going on that uh, our infrastructure, our, our grid is very vulnerable to. We are living a time of increased seismic activity. And I talked about this uh, in another video, the, the mysterious movements that are happening under our feet with the core and the mantle of our planet pushing magma toward the surface are activating uh, greater degrees of seismic activity and especially along fault lines where the plates come together, tri triple plate junctions like the one under Turkey. For example, we've seen 7.7, 7.8 magnitude uh, earthquakes, Pakistan, but also in the Pacific and the Pacific Ring of Fire. So that is Japan on the west side and uh, along the, the western seaboard of America on, on the east side of the Ring of Fire. Uh, all have impacts on power grids and infrastructure. And then certainly uh, social unrest, and we saw this in the summer of, uh, was it 20 and 21, riots in the cities, knocked out power uh, locally. It wasn't regional, but it, but it was local. But these are all things... So even if you're not into the cyber attack conversation, these are other factors that can and have in the past and very possibly will in the, the future uh, impact our, our power grids. So I'm focusing on the cyber attack, again, because that was the question that came up during the, the Q&A, and it's what I began this conversation with. Where are we vulnerable as families? Well, when that grid goes down, we lose electricity, we lose water, we lose food. We lose the ability for finances because when those grids go down, there's no ATMs, there's no banks open. Uh, you've got whatever you've got in your pocket until those systems come back up. And if they're down for a prolonged period of time, uh, you may be vulnerable to not being able to get something that you need for your family maybe groceries, maybe fuel, if, if it's possible, even, even buy fuel. So what I want to talk to you about now is uh, some, some ways to mitigate this. Power is a big deal, and it means different things to different people. Some families, when the power goes out, it's like <laughs> kids love it. It's kind of like a, a, a camping experience. You get out the candles, you get out the flashlights, and you weather it out for a few hours or uh, maybe a couple of days. We have a cyber attack. I think you're going to look, be looking at an extended outage. It's not going to be just uh, just a couple of days. One of the reasons for that, by the way, uh, and I experienced this personally. I Many of you know I live in a rural area. Uh, my wife and I, northern New Mexico. A few years ago, there was a, a power outage in the state of Nevada uh, with a freak, a freak, uh incident with a series of transformers of electrical transformers in the state of nevada and you say well, what's that got to do with new mexico well this is how interconnected everything is when those transformers went down the way they went down was very unusual and it created what is called a cascade effect and the grid began to 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 go down there's a cascade effect blowing out transformer after transformer after transformer all down through Nevada and into Arizona and then up through uh, New, central New Mexico, up into northern New Mexico to the Colorado border. And our power was down for, for a, a couple of weeks. We had just no, no power. And it was a big deal because it was wintertime. Uh, here in northern New Mexico, poultry farmers lost thousands and thousands and thousands of chickens. They just froze to death. There was no way to, to keep them warm. Indoor crops, elderly people died in their homes because they had no heat. Uh, interestingly, at the same time, natural gas was shut off to northern New Mexico. There was a big controversy and a big story behind that. But the the, the feeder pipeline uh, that comes up from Texas, a valve was closed. So we had not only no natural gas, but we had no electricity for an extended period of time. 
So power is a big deal to people. And what I want you to know, there are all kinds of ways uh, to, to deal with this. And the people in the conference I was at, many of them were talking about costs. They said, you know, we can't afford, you know, big, expensive backup power. Well, there's different kinds of backup power. So I'm going to say, first of all, light use. There is a company called AIMTOM. They have a, a little 440-watt solar generator. So it is recharged with a solar panel that you can take outside during the daytime, daylight hours. It's not going to run your house, but it will run your cell phone. It'll run your computers. It will run your home entertainment devices for your kids. It will run lights. Uh, you know, you plug in your lamps and things like that. And this is what it looks like. It's a little, uh, there's a handle on top, a little handheld unit. That is a collapsible solar panel that you're seeing in the back. We have a couple of these and we've used them, uh, you know, for camping. We've used them on hiking. Uh, we have used them when power has gone down. They're relatively inexpensive. This particular model is just under 500 bucks, including the solar panels. If you don't buy the solar panels, then, uh, and there are other ways you can charge this from DC. You can charge it from your car battery. You can charge it from the wall when power exists in the wall. And you can charge it from the solar panel. Without the solar panels, I believe it's about $125, $135. So the solar panel, uh, the collapsible solar panel, it's a fast charge solar panel. It's a big part of, of that cost. But uh, this is a place to begin. And if you don't like this particular system, check it out on Amazon. And it will bring up similar systems that have different capabilities. Maybe you want to look at those. Uh, these are some of the features that you, you see here. It's got uh, USB ports. It's got a display telling you exactly how much power you've got left. Um, you can run, I'm just looking at my computer screen here, which is so far away from me, I can't read it. <laughs> uh, yeah, you've got the, the two USB ports on there and it's got regular AC plugs. So you can just plug, you can take a big extension cord plug it into this box, have a box in one part of your house or run that extension cord to somewhere else with a power strip. And then you can run two or three things off of this. Uh, so it's relatively lightweight, relatively inexpensive, relatively easy to use. This is what these uh, uh, solar panels look like. They they fold up into a you know, nice, it's almost like a little briefcase that you can carry with you. 60 watt panels, you can buy multiple panels if you'd like, okay? So that's one level, very, very simple. Uh, here's all the things that you can do. Uh, it just lists everything that you can do on here. You can run a phone. You can run a mini fridge. If you won't run a full-size fridge with a mini fridge. Uh, CPAP, those of you that may be using a CPAP for, uh, <clears throat> for sleep, you can use fans, a Wi-Fi router. Uh, LED TV, lights, a lantern, laptops uh, for 60 watt hours, all from that little aim tom. Okay. Now for medium use, if you want something bigger than that, there's a company called EcoFlow and they've got a whole range of things from uh, low wattage, very inexpensive uh, to, to more powerful units. Uh, they have a power station. It's called Delta 1800 watt, uh, 3300 watt peak. That looks like this. It's a little bit bigger, a little bit heavier. You can see on the front end, you've got the USB ports on there. You've got a, a very nice readout that tells you exactly uh, how much power you've got left. Uh, and that gives you an idea of, of when you need to recharge it again. Uh, it's about $1,000 on Amazon. They have sales on them sometimes. And this is uh, without the, the solar panels. So here you're looking at the back end on the right-hand side. You can see it's got a number of um, uh, AC outlets. So you can plug multiple things into there, or you can plug one extension cord, run it through the house into the living room with a power strip, and then have multiple cords where the kids got their computers and you've got your computers, and maybe you've got a lamp or something like that. This is a, a really very, very powerful unit. Uh, because it has so many uses. And I'm just, I'm going to get close to the computer so I can, I can read some of these to you indoors. Uh, it'll run a, uh, a home, your, your lighting system, 36 hours. It will run a CPAP for 18 to 22 hours. 
it will run a refrigerator and it will run a full size refrigerator uh, between 10 and 20 hours. When the power went out in Texas uh, two winters ago, I believe it was, a lot of people in Texas had these units and they, they used them. They had maybe two of them in the house. So one of them was charging and the other one they had running the freezer and running the fridge so that they didn't lose any food. And that's important. This one will even run a washer. Now, I don't think it will run a dryer if a dryer is a 220 dryer, but it'll run a washer, uh, 18 to 22 hours, television, 15 to 18 hours, high wattage uh, hair dryers. Oh, man, you got to have a hair dryer, right? <laughs> you got to have a hair dryer when the power goes down. Uh, microwave oven uh, uses a little bit more power, 1 to uh, 1.8, almost two hours. Uh, coffee makers, blenders, you know, you're talking about 50 and 60 hours that you can run from these. And they, they have larger units that will run even more. What I want to say to you is I personally use EcoFlow. I've had really good luck with them. I think they're well manufactured. They're packaged well, um, really professional. I mean, when you get this stuff, it's it's just packed really, really well. Uh, the instructions are multilingual, very easy to use, very easy to set up, very intuitive. Um, and I, I think this could make a big difference in someone's home. You could run a small heater. And I think it actually says above, does it say a heater? Well, it says a toaster. You could run a small heater to keep, uh, if this you know were happened in the wintertime. And their backup uh, power the solar uh, panels, they are in really nice cases that fold up. They got a handle on top, uh, about 300 bucks a piece. And I just want to say, you know, sometimes you're looking at this and you say, man, it sounds like a lot of money or I don't think I can do that now. When the day comes and there's no power for weeks, all of a sudden that thousand or that $1,300, $2,500, it doesn't sound like a big deal at all. You'd give anything to be able to have a little bit of heat. You can boil some water uh, to cook some food. You can do all kinds of things with this. So that's why I think this is really, really important. Uh, now, if you are looking, some people are looking at the high end. This isn't for everyone. Some people want a backup power for the entire house. They don't want these little portable things, you know, for a few hundred or, you know, a thousand, twenty five hundred dollars. They want the whole house. Uh, I want you to know that I have personally used a company called Generac. They're well-made units. They maintain them. You have to maintain them on an annual basis. They come out and they change the oil, change the filters, all that kind of, of thing. They can run from, uh, well, these were prices in 2023. I don't know what they are now. But in the U.S., uh, between 5700 and 7400 almost 7500 bucks. These are big units, and here's what they look like. Uh, they sit outside the home, and they will run the entire house. They, the box on the left is a little sensor. It senses when your power goes out, and these generators kick on. They are fueled by propane, so it's not smelly gasoline that you have to go out and fill you know, every couple of hours. This runs on a propane tank, so if you're in a rural area, you're probably already on propane. You just hook this into your propane, uh, and the only caution is... Uh, if you need your propane for other things, you don't want to use it all up on, on a, a generator like this, but you can turn this off and on and uh, swap it out with the other smaller units that, that we just showed. So maybe at night when there's no solar, you want to run some things, you use this big one. And then during the daytime when you got some solar, maybe your house has solar panels, uh, you turn this off so you're not using that propane. So I'm just showing you options. That's all. If you don't like this, there are other kinds of units. This is a 22 kilowatt backup home generator. So it's a lot of power for uh, for a big home. It will keep everything on, all of your lights, all of your heat, all of your appliances, washer, dryer, refrigerator, hair dryers, TVs, computers, everything, uh, if you want to go in, in that, that direction. So now you've got low, medium, and uh, and high output generators, something to think about. Okay, this is what they look like on the inside. It's air cooled, natural gas, or propane. They'll run on either one. Yeah, if you're if you're running natural gas, a neighborhood of natural gas, you're probably not going to run out of the natural gas. So this thing, you know, will run run forever. They're quiet. 
uh, they're really nice to use. This is what they look like outside the home, okay? Uh, I have one of these that I have used and it has worked like a charm for years. Water, this is a big deal. Uh, one of the first things that goes out when the power goes out is water will go out as well. Now, I'm not talking about just powering your house. I'm talking about a municipal cyber attack, power outage. There's no power to pump the water to the homes. There's no power to bring the water into the refinery. There's no power to uh, to filter the water before it goes out. Water's going to be one that's going to be a, a commodity in tremendous demand. It's not easy to store water. It is easy, but it, it's it's not what people often think it is. You don't just take some water and throw it into uh, bottles and expect it to last forever. Water typically has some level of bacteria in it, and that bacteria has to be addressed if you're going to store it for any period of time. Uh, I personally uh, am using a, a system. They're called water bricks for water storage. They look like this. Uh, each one is five gallons. They are very easy to carry. And you see the interesting shape. They're shaped like that because you stack them. You stack them and then there's a little spout. Uh, I'm sorry, these are three and a half gallon. Three and a half gallon. They, I think they have five gallon, but these are the three and a half gallon uh, water bricks. So what you're looking at are six bricks that you're seeing right there and they'll stack. You can stack these in your garage, in a closet, in a pantry. You can put them underneath the bed if they're not stacked. Um, and when you want to use them, you don't have to lift them up every time. Uh, so this grouping of six water bricks is $115.99. They have this spout that makes it really easy to use. As you go through each brick, you take that spout and you screw it on to the place uh, in, in place of the lid that you're seeing there with a the handle on it. And then it makes it really, really easy to use. Uh, I, it's an optional spigot that you get with it. And I don't know that my, I didn't talk about it here. One of the things that you need to do, and when you go on, you can buy these on Amazon. It's called the Water Brick. Or you can go to the website I've got here, www.preparedplanet.com. Uh, there are additives. You put a couple of drops of the additives into each water brick when you fill the water. Uh, and it is very low dose. It is harmless to drink. Um, and it mitigates the bacteria and allows you to store that water a little bit longer, okay? So something to think about, water's gonna be a big deal for you, uh, and food as well. One of the things that came up in the conference, I was amazed how many people in that conference did not have food to last them more than a day or two in their home because they are accustomed, they are blessed with the ability to be able to stop by the market every day on the way home from work or school and have fresh food every day. And I love that. Uh, it's awesome while it's there. If for some reason we had the kind of cyber attack they're talking about, you're not going to be able to do that. And we, it was very sad. I think maybe you remember uh, on the island of Manhattan, New York. Uh, I think it was pre COVID when a big storm hit it, uh, it closed the, because of the ice and snow. Trucks could not get onto the island. Power lines froze, and under the weight of the ice, they snapped and broke. Power was down. No food could get in. Trucks could not get in. Grocery sh shelves were bare. Stores were closed. Nothing was there. And literally, people with six- and seven-figure incomes were going through dumpsters looking for something to sustain them until they could get things back up and running again. It's a frightening thought. I hope it never happens again, and maybe it won't. If something like that were to happen, it's only a problem if you're not prepared. Backup food is pretty easy. Uh, there are all kinds of resources out there. Let me just give you a couple that I have used and I do use personally. This is a company that has a 40-day supply of organic prepared food. Uh, I'm a non-carnivore. I have been all my life. Uh, I like to be vegan when I'm home, when I'm on the road. I cannot be uh, and still get the protein that I need. So I'll eat eggs on the road or I'll eat uh, salmon maybe, and uh, depending on where I am in the world. Uh, sea bass if I'm in Northern Europe for protein. 
So those things aren't in here, but for organic, a 40 day organic preparedness, this company is called survive to thrive. Uh, the contents come in pails like this. So you can buy multiples and stack them if you'd like 40 days. Uh, it depends on how many people are in your family, how, how large of a community you, you want to sustain. Uh, this was $300 for one of these. These are meal prep. They're not full meals. So they are freeze dried, uh, many different varieties of beans and rice. Let's see that I put, yeah. So I put some pictures in there for you. Open up one so you can see it. Uh, black beans, rice, quinoa, things like that. I said freeze dried. It's not freeze dried. It is uh, 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 shrink packed. So they've taken all the air out, vacuum packed. That's what I'm saying, vacuum packed. So this stuff will last, the shelf life, I think is like 25 years if you don't use it. Um, I recommend rotating through your food supplies before they go bad. Just keep an eye on the expiration date and maybe order, order a new one and then use the one that's here, use it at home. So if you want to prepare your own meals, you use this and, and put things together. Uh, so the beans and the rice, the quinoa and things like that. That's what you're seeing here. And they've got all, go to the website. They've got all kinds of combinations of, of things. This is one that, that I choose because of, uh, of our lifestyle. Uh, this is what is in there. Rolled oats, white rice, millet, garbanzo beans, green lentils, black beans, pinto beans, quinoa. There was a superfood, green food powder, chia seeds, fermented miso, and some zippy Cajun spice mix. So, uh, it kind of livens things up a little bit. So this is if you want to, so if you've got eggs, for example, you can have eggs and, and rice or eggs and quinoa is something I, I like to have a lot, eggs, broccoli, and quinoa. We grow a lot of our own green food here. So this would supplement the green food that we have. There is uh, another company that I supplement this with that's got the full meal. So this survive to thrive are the components of a meal and you can slice and dice and put together whatever you'd like to put together. These are full meals, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's, it's a Valley food storage is, is what it's called. It's about two, 200 bucks on Amazon. Uh, the particular in one of these tins, there are 80 servings and the servings are, they're non-GMO. Uh, there were no, not a lot of fillers. There are no fillers and a lot of added junk and things like that. It comes in these pouches. And uh, what I, I purchased in this particular one, there were 40 servings of breakfast, 40 servings of lunch and dinner uh, is what we had in here. And you can see some of the things like they are oatmeal and granola kind of things for breakfast. They had some egg things for breakfast. Uh, there were beans and quinoa kinds of things for lunch and dinner. So, you know, if if we were in an extended power outage, cyber grid, nothing is moving down situation, uh, this could make a difference for you and your family. Quick and easy, all you'd have to do would be to have enough power to heat the water to add to these. And you've got that if you've got one of those little generators that we just looked at or something like that. It doesn't have to be that brand, just something like that. So you can you can heat up some water, uh, you know, put in these different ways to heat up the water. There are little hot water rods you plug in and you put that rod in the water and it heats the water immediately. Uh, or maybe you've got a hot pot, you know, that you use or something like that. So you get the idea, you get the idea of where we're going here. So these are what's included in one of these one of these panels. I'll be honest, there are times when I'm traveling so much that I don't go to the grocery store. Uh, Martha and I don't go to the grocery store because we're not gonna eat all the food, it'll just go bad. And we'll reach into some of these, maybe for a quick meal, you know, before we head out to the airport or something like that. And they're actually pretty, pretty tasty. So uh, I want you to think about this and I want you to think about it for the reasons that we're talking about, all right? So this is what I wanted to say to you for these particular, uh, these particular categories. And I hope this is useful to you to give you some ideas of, of where you might want to look uh, in terms of, of, you know, even how to get started. Now, when should you do this? 
I'm going to be very honest with you. My sense is with the intensity of the events, the events that are unfolding right now, I think we're going to see something happen sooner than later. I don't know exactly what it is because there's so many potentials on the horizon. Whichever potential unfolds, the net result is that there's a good possibility we're going to lose power. We are going to lose access to the things that are familiar to us every day. So whether it's a wartime scenario, whether it is a cyber attack scenario, uh, it's human, it's intentional, and it's meant to cause confusion and it's meant to weaken our society. And there are a lot of reasons why uh, uh, those things are happening now beyond the scope of what I can talk about right here. What I want you to do is to kick it into high gear and think about this beyond thinking about it. I want you to act upon it. Uh, don't put it off, you know, for later in the summer or sometime in the fall. Sometime in the next uh, few days, next couple of weeks, at least go shopping and at least get the bare minimum so that you can be responsible for yourself and your family, your friends, your loved ones, whoever it is that looks to you for, for love and support. And uh, I think you'll think back to this conversation and you'll be glad that you did. I am hoping that you hear this from the place it's coming from. It's my concern for you and the reality of a world that has come to our doorstep, not from the fear, just the recognition that now is different. So we have to think a little bit differently and be responsible for ourselves uh, and our loved ones in this, this little window of time. So drop me some comments. Let me know how you feel about it in the comment section. I, I will ask our producers to leave the comments on. Sometimes they have turned them off because of some of the hate that has come through in those comments. So please be kind to one another when you're uh, responding to one another in those comments so we can leave those comments on. And this is how we build community, all right? All right, thank you for a few minutes of your day, sharing a few minutes of your day with me today or your evening with me. Uh, and I hope this has been useful and meaningful to you. I look forward to our next.